Hello and welcome to uh, Authentic Word, the Book of Acts. This is uh, chapter 15. And even before I begin to pray, I can see why this has been so contended by the adversary, by the enemy that would not want us to make it through chapter by chapter, line upon line through the Book of Acts. I see it. I began this study back in 2015. I took a two year sabbatical and began picking it back up and I want to make it through chapter 28. Right now we're on chapter 15. I pray you've already listened to the previous ones and my goal is one a week for the rest of 2019. We're in 2019, it's actually May 2019. One a week so that we can finish with the book of Acts and just go back and say, la, pause and calmly think on what Holy Spirit wants us to see, that we are yet living in the 29th book of Acts. There's only 28 books in the Canaan of scripture, but Holy Spirit is yet acting and living and writing the gospels through our lives, writing the acts of Holy Spirit through our lives. So that's what our goal is. God, we thank you and praise you for Holy Spirit that is our teacher, our strength and our advocate. He's our helper. He's our guide. He leads us and guides us into all truth. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us and giving us uh, the capacity to the grace of God, the grace, the mercy, the unmerited favor, the grace, the ability to do that which you, O oh God, have us in the earth realm to do that we receive through the agent of Holy Spirit in our lives. We give you access to teach us, lead us, guide us, instruct us, direct us, correct us. As we go through Acts chapter 15, we say, have your way. Show us our role, our part as Holy Spirit desires to yet live through us in this book. In Jesus name. Amen. So the book of Acts chapter 15 um, and the Bible panorama that I found on Bible Gateway, it breaks it down into five sections. And so the first section is verse one through five, and it's talking about circumcision and this contention that came up because of uh, circumcision. And then verses six through 21 is talking about consideration. Consider what's going on. Consider a lot of considerations going on. And then verse 22 through 29 is a confirmation where the discussion is confirmed and, and dealt with. And then verse 30 through 35, we see a picture of the church and how the dealings in the church should be. But then in verse 36 through 41, we see a contention taking place. So here in, in Acts 15, there are the five C's of Acts 15, and we're going to try and get to that contentious piece so that we can see how we ought not operate, how we ought not behave. And, and expose the plans and the tactics of the enemy to cause contention to come amongst the brethren. So verse 1 through 5, looking at circumcision, or um, one version of the Bible says to let outsiders inside. So the, the, the question is, do we let outsiders inside? And then also another version called it the council in Jerusalem. And then another version called it uh, conflict over circumcision. Let me just po pose this question. I remember the first time when I began to see in the New Testament that there's this conflict over whether they're circumcised or not. And my question was, are you looking at their private parts to know if they're circumcised or not? Or do you just assume you know based off their externals what it looks like? You know, in the New Testament, circumcision is of the heart, not the natural organ anyway. So, hmm, I just had to put that out there. That was my, in the beginning. That was my childish spiritual mind, my immature spiritual mind wondering. But as I've studied it even the more, especially with the mindset that circumcision is of the heart, it's the carnal nature of the heart being cut back with the two-edged sword of the word with the word of God okay so let's just read I'll try we may not read verse for verse but we're going to look at what's going on in each of these sections so verse 1 through 5 it says at verse 1 but some men came from came down from Judea and were instructing the brethren unless you're circumcised in accordance with the Mosaic custom you can't be saved and so I said the Mosaic customs, they were trying to put religious ways above the truth. The truth is salvation through Jesus Christ. Doesn't have all these other religious ways, whether it's the Mosaic way or whatever. Anyway, 
And so keep going at verse two, it says, and when Paul and Barnabas had no small disagreement and discussion with them, it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of their number should go up to Jerusalem and confer with the apostles, the special messengers and the elders about this matter. So as I was studying this out, I said about this matter, they were, they were to bring wisdom on the matter because when it said a small uh, disagreement and discussion uh, that strife strife came up and so another note that I found now the other ones those were my thoughts this is a note that I found the success of this party would have perpetuated Judaism and forever have neutralized those philanthropic principles of the gospel which the experience of the world and the wisdom of God alike had shown to be necessary to the moral renovation of the human race so basically the other thing that I saw there was because of deep prejudices among whether you're the circumcision or the uncircumcision whether you're Jewish or Gentile. So it was deep prejudices against Gentile nations that were coming to the surface and Holy Spirit was allowing this to happen. Keep going. Verse 3, it says, So being fitted out and sent on their way to the church, they went through both Phoenicia and Samaria, telling of the conversion of the Gentiles, the heathen, and they caused great rejoicing among the brethren. Um, I said conversions should cause a great rejoicing. So as they went and were telling, it should be a great rejoicing, not this contentious strife. They saved, but did they get saved like I got saved? Everybody not going to get saved like you got saved. Did they receive Jesus? That's the common denominator, not your personal experience, but where is Jesus at in their lives? Or do they have access to Holy Spirit that we pray about all the time? Um, keep reading verse 4 when they arrived in Jerusalem they were heartily welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders and they told them all that God had accomplished through them verse 5 says but some who believed who acknowledged Jesus as their savior and devoted themselves to him remember that's what it's all about believing acknowledging Jesus as savior and developing devoting yourself to him they belonged to the sect of the Pharisees. So they were more identifying with the Pharisaical roots than these newfound roots in Jesus. Anyway, and they rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise the Gentile converts and to charge them to obey the law of Moses. This was one thing that the Holy Spirit showed me. This was Paulette. Uh, some old wineskin believers or leaders had a problem with this new group of converts not following the old ways. I said religion focuses on externals, not on heart conversions. You're supposed to look the part. They wanted that's people that's so busy trying to clean the fish before it's caught the fish. Anyway, uh, there will always be the some type who are stuck on the old and want to keep everyone in bondage to religion. It's always going to be that way. The Bible is showing us that. I wish it could be another way, but the Bible is showing us this way. Um, I got a big note here. I don't want to read this all, but it's just saying that, um, there's this contention. There's always going to be false brethren unawares, according to Galatians 2, 4, that come in and they want to spy out the liberty of those in Jesus Christ. So are you saved when you're more concerned about liberties versus religious strictness my question is is it false is it a false brethren or is it an authentic brethren is just stuck on the old and needs to drink some of the new wine of holy spirit okay let's keep reading at verse six it switches and talks about the jerusalem council and as was said this is also the section on consideration so the apostles and the elders were assembled together to look into and consider this matter and after there had been a long debate Peter got up and said to them, <laughs> Brethren, you know that quite a while ago, I said back in chapter 10 with the conversion of Cornelius and the first Gentiles to be saved, God made a choice or a selection from among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the message of the gospel concerning the attainment through Christ of salvation in the kingdom of God. And let me say this. What were the Gentiles supposed to hear? The message of salvation through Christ, not the message of get under Mosaic law. Just, just putting that out there. They, they, so they heard the message of the gospel and believe a credit and place their confidence in it, in Jesus Christ as the savior, as access into the kingdom. That's what it was saying. And God 
who is acquainted with and understands the heart, remember that's what a circumcision is, bore witness to them, giving them the Holy Spirit as he also did to us. Verse 9, and he made no difference between us and them, but cleansed their hearts by faith. I love the Amplified. It's telling us what faith is right there in Acts 15 verse 9. If you want to know, do you have faith or the right kind of faith? This is what it is. It says, who cleansed their hearts by faith, by a strong and welcome conviction that Jesus is the Messiah through whom we obtain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. And then I'll add on Matthew 11, 28 through 30. So now what you are to do is learn of him and come unto him. All you who labor and are heavy laden, don't get up under another labor of religion. Let's keep reading verse 10. It says, now then, why do you try to test God by putting a yoke on the necks of the disciples such as neither our forefathers nor we ourselves were able to? to endure. So that he's saying, why are you trying to make them live to a standard that you know is unattainable? Verse 11 says, but we believe that we are saved through the grace, the undeserved favor and mercy of the Lord Jesus, just as they are. And so I found a note that says this yoke is not circumcision for there is no difficulty in submitting to that, but it is the law under whose provisions no man can live without incurring its condemnation. So if you're trying to get them to live under the law, then you fight with Romans 8.1 that says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're trying to get them to submit to the law, there's condemnation there. But submit to Jesus. Jesus fulfills the law. And so this is why there's always a strong disagreement or a contention amongst the brethren that are trying to get people to live up in alignment with religious rigmarole instead of Jesus and have Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, teach you, instruct you, correct you, convict you, redirect you, rebuke you. It's not just all patty cake. Some stuff we're doing wrong. He'll tell you your heart is wrong right there. Okay, let me keep going. So that was verse 11. Wait, back up at verse 10. Uh, the yoke. Uh, we couldn't endure, trying to bring them back to bondage instead of free in Christ. We've got to be careful not to do that to the converts and the people of God. Verse 12 says, then the whole assembly remained silent. A holy hush fell on them. And they listened attentively as Barnabas and Paul rehearsed what signs and wonders God had performed through them among the Gentiles. Um, verse 13, when they had finished talking, James replied. So Paul and Barnabas began to speak and the spirit of the Holy Spirit brought a hush on everybody. They were listening. So at verse 12, I said, remain silent. When you are being used as a mouthpiece of the Lord, he will silence the strife and bring forth truth. He'll bring forth wisdom. He will do that. And so James came and he began to speak to the brethren. He said, look, listen to me, Peter has rehearsed uh, how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people. So it goes on. There's a paraphrase. We're going to just paraphrase right here, verse 14 through 18 of what was being said. Uh, Peter just was telling them, look, it was foretold that this was going to happen. This happened, verse 18. So the Lord says the Lord who has been making these things known from the beginning of the world. Who made them known? The Lord. Verse 19, it goes on to say, Therefore, it is my opinion, this is still James speaking, he said, um, yeah, James is speaking, he said, therefore, it is my opinion that we should not put obstacles in the way of and annoy and disturb the, those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Verse 20, but we should send word to them in writing to abstain from and avoid anything that has been polluted by being offered to idols and all sexual impurity and eating meat of animals that uh, have been strangled and tasting of blood. So at verse 20, when he told them abstain from idolatry because that's what contaminates the heart. Anything that was offered to him, that's where contamination comes in. And so verse 21, it says, For from ancient generations Moses has had his preachers in every town, for he is read aloud from Sabbath, he is read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. So basically he was saying, we're not throwing out the Mosaic law, it's read. And it, it's in front of us, but don't put people under bondage to it. And, and our 
Jesus came so that we can have freedom and it's not necessarily bondage, but we're a bond servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have Holy Spirit that helps us be my body, his life. I just had to throw that out there. So now we're getting to the second section or the third section of confirmation, verse 22 through 29. Um, these are letters that were sent to the Gentiles. Let me flip my page here. Verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders together with the whole church resolved to select men from among their number and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas called Barnabas and Silas, both leading men among the brethren and sent them. So there is this, they're like, I hear what you're saying, but we still want to hear from somebody else. I don't want to take it from you. That's just strife to the utmost. But God is patient with the nature of mankind. It says, verse 23, with them they sent the following letter, the brethren, both the apostles and the elders, to the brethren who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Verse 24, as we have heard that some persons from our number have disturbed you with their teaching, unsettling your minds and throwing you into confusion, although we gave them no express orders or instructions on the points in question. And so my thing is this. What we should not be doing to anyone who receives Christ is to cause them to have, uns to unsettle their mind, to disturb them, to throw them into confusion. Who's the author of confusion? Who are you a servant for? Okay, I said the word itself offends. Don't add to it with the man side restrictions of religion. Okay, let's just try and finish this up. I'm not going to finish every verse, but I just want us to see. Um, uh, verse 25, he says, this was resolved in the assembly. These men, they have hazarded their lives. It meant they have committed, they have committed their lives to God. They've given their lives over for the sake of others. And so they're coming. Verse 28, for it has, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to lay upon you um, any greater burden than these indispensable requirements that you abstain from idolatry and sexual impurity is what it goes on in verse 29 to say. So when they said that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to weigh the people down with extra rules, just abstain from idolatry. That's the true commandment. The first one, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus fulfills that and the Holy Spirit empowers you to do all of that. So we get to this last section looking at this contention, this strong contention. I got three minutes left. Lord, help me uh, close this out. That there was a separation of Barnabas and Saul. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit of what was going on. So they went to Antioch and the people rejoiced with consolation and encouragement as they brought it forth. And, and verse 32, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, they were inspired interpreters of the will and purposes of God. They urged and warned and consoled and encouraged the brethren with many words and strengthened them. That's what prophetic voices are to be doing today. We are to um, prophesy and, and encourage and warn and direct. It's not just all rebuke and it's not just all stuff. But we, this is what we're supposed to do. Urge, warn, console, and encourage and strengthen the people of God. And after spending some time there, they sent back by the brethren with the greeting, peace to those who had sent them. However, Silas decided to stay on there. So Silas kind of, it said Silas decided. It didn't say Holy Spirit told him to. It was his decision. So then at verse 35, Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch and with many others also continued teaching and proclaiming the good news and the word of the Lord concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom. And after some time, uh, Paul said to Barnabas, come, let us go back again, visit and help the men and minister to the brethren. They were going back to shore up the people who had received salvation through Jesus Christ in every town where we made known the message of the Lord and see how they are getting along. They knew that strife would come in and contention would come in. in my book, Renewal of the Mind, I have a whole section on contention and how as believers, we cannot be people causing contention amongst the brethren, which is kind of sort of what happened here. But then again, yes and no, because they didn't tear down their testimony. I got way more than I can say in one minute. But what happened was they were about to go Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. Paul said, I don't want to take him with us. He deserted us in the past. And there was a sharp disagreement between them. They separated, but they continued to work in the Lord 
and the contention and the disagreement wasn't that bad because they still talk about it in the future. Sometimes when we have disagreements with people, whether they're new in the ministry or we're new in the ministry, we be careful not to tear down somebody's name and testimony and the works that they're doing as unto the Lord because they rubbed you the wrong way one time or a few times. And that's basically, I, mean, I don't have time to read it in its entirety, but there is scripture. When I studied this thing out, that there was preservation. They both continue to do the work of the Lord. And later on, Paul went back and said, he's helpful. He's useful. So make sure that we are, um, 